I also still felt the need in the back of my head to, for whatever reason, to protect Lydia and her feelings too. Mm -hmm. So I kept on talking to her. I don't know, I didn't bring that up to you because I didn't want to, you know, dig up the past. <sighs> Like all types of narcissists, Uche is in love with this idealized, grandiose image of himself as the savior, as the one who helps. And like all narcissists, that image of himself allows him to avoid deep feelings of insecurity. But that image of himself is definitely false because you really see it when he tries to act all noble, like he doesn't want to badmouth Lydia. And literally 30 seconds later, he's badmouthing her. And I know y'all are becoming friends and I didn't want to like start to badmouth your friends. I found out she was doing things to invade my privacy. I started receiving messages from people. And then the worst thing was, she drives over to my house. She takes a picture of my driveway. And I'm like, wow, I should have told Aaliyah that because she would have known maybe Lydia still obsessed with him. So yes, this obsession with an idealized version of yourself, an idealized image of yourself is true of all narcissists. But I believe Uche displays antagonistic narcissistic qualities because he has a very hostile and unforgiving nature, especially when Elia is trying to explain why she left and he starts attacking her. Because I don't have you yet. You had one day, one day. You had to sit in a room with a girl for one day. I don't feel like it's fair for you to say that I just don't value you or what we have because I did something to protect me. Exactly, you thought about yourself. Antagonistic narcissists are also very quick to take offense. They hold grudges and they enjoy making people suffer. My heart is still in your hands. There isn't anybody else that I want. I think it's over between us. So this week we're focusing on the antagonistic narcissist and using Uche as an example. But of course, I hope it goes without saying that we're not diagnosing anyone with a personality disorder. We're just listing traits and those, in my humble opinion, traits Uche really embodies because he just loves to be right and always have the final say and will go to great lengths to prove it. Like in the beginning of the fifth episode, when he finds out that Elia left and he tries to reach out to her through the producers, at first he's like, oh, I'm ready to talk. Please track her down. I'm ready to speak. And then later when he sits down with her, it's just to guilt trip her and then dump her. I can't accept this without having the chance to talk to her. Like, I need to talk to her. I was ready to ask you to spend the rest of our lives together. And also all his huffing and puffing and all these phony expressions, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> just... And by the way, he mentioned on recently on the Q&A or the something he did on Instagram, like he's trying to basically show receipts, which turned out to be as convincing of receipts as the ones that Zena produced from season three. Basically, he because at one point he's like, oh, that was a soundbite when he said it's over between us. Okay, soundbite, but where did it come from? Like, you literally said it at some point, maybe not in that conversation, but you had to have said it to Aliyah at some point in the show. So he's just deflecting. But anyway, we're gonna get to his, the late stuff that he did on Instagram when we talk about one of the signs of antagonistic narcissism, which is gaslighting. But we're gonna get to that later. And for those who sometimes maybe point out that I focus more on the women when I criticize or pick out characters who are delusional, you'll be very happy to know that this week is all about the men's. And speaking of which, there's an honorable mention in this video to Izzy, who also displays a lot of narcissistic qualities because he just can't bear not to be liked. Because now he's with Stacy, right? He's one of the only two couples who are gonna get married. Yet he's reaching out to uh, Lydia and Johnny just to prove the point that he cut them off and they were into him. At the time when I cut you off, I was about Johnny. Your intent was to go with me. Get that. Like, what is the point? I don't understand those conversations, but we're gonna get into Izzy also later in this video. But of course, Uche is the focus of this video and his awe-inspiring ability to just spin reality and blame the other person and never acknowledge his own mistakes. He's like a shark when he smells that the other person is being weak and Aliyah is a perfect partner for him in this because she immediately like cowers and becomes weak and apologetic. The second he senses any insecurity in her, he just pounces. Like in that scene in the very beginning when they're on the phone and he just hears her crying and being apologetic, immediately he shifts to being condescending. No, you're not. Ah, oh, this is exactly what I thought was gonna happen. I was gonna let myself get close to the wrong person. 
So yeah, Uche's lack of empathy and his selfishness is truly like a work of art. A work of art that you have to study. And speaking of studying, joining me this week is Alan Watts, a spiritual thinker, writer, philosopher who introduced Buddhism to the Western audiences in the 60s and 70s. Actually, he passed away already in the 70s. But Uche's shenanigans this week were so intense that they made Alan Watts' spirit rise from the dead and give him a call directly from the 70s to just point out Uche's selfishness. How do you feel about me right now? You are totally selfish. You don't have a good thing to be said for you at all. You are a complete, utter rascal. Hey y'all, it's me in denial, your favorite drag therapist, the only drag therapist on the internet. As I always say, I'm in denial, so you, Uche, can wake up. And speaking of Uche, this week we're focusing on the antagonistic narcissist and the five signs or behavioral patterns that the antagonistic narcissist uses. And basically, these are used for the antagonistic narcissist to establish their supremacy over someone else. And they can all be summed up under their strategy of dismiss, deny and devalue. When you talk about dismissing, basically the antagonistic narcissist will always dismiss when you point out a negative trait of theirs. And then if they can't dismiss, they will deny. And the devaluing comes into play when they are threatened by someone else, by someone who's truly confident. Or like in Uche's example, when he's threatened that Lydia has actually moved on from him. Y'all are looking real peaceful over here. So let's go to the first sign, which is basically that the antagonistic narcissist needs to always come out on top. Everything for them is a competition and they always need to be right and they always need to have the last word and they will go to great lengths to prove it. Just like when he tracks Lydia down to the barbecue party, just to point out what she did to him before. Um, Lydia, uh, you want to chat? No, really? Which is insane to me because according to Uche, Lydia is a stalker and she won't let him go. Yet you're the one who's chasing her. She's actually marrying someone else and she's not talking to you. So who's the one who's doing the stalking? Yeah, the irony is crazy that he calls her a stalker, yet he's the one who's tracking her down because he can't bear the idea that she actually moved on and is with someone else. And I think he also can't bear the idea that she's still on the show and he's trying to find a way to still be on the show by tracking her down. And then when he finally sits down with her, he's trying to get in her head by reminding her about the connection they had, the instant heat, the instant connection between them and how she knew his favorite color. Okay, what is the point? When we first met, I think that there was this instant spark, this instant attraction. I think the fact that I felt wanted by you, needed by you, I think that brought me closer to you. It's really insane because if you're truly a victim of a stalker, it would be heaven that they're marrying someone else and are moving on. And the most pathetic part in this confrontation is the evidence he has that screenshots from girls who are telling him that Lydia was watching their stories. Uh, first of all, stories are public. They're there to be watched. So how is she stalking if she's looking at stories? I started getting messages from girls that I follow on Instagram saying that you have been watching their stories. They're sending me screenshots of your profile. <laughs> what? Exactly. What? And even if she was in love with you and she was stalking people's stories to track you down and see the girls that you like, She's moved on, so why are you tracking her down? Anyway, this is a very nice segue into the second sign, which is spinning reality and gaslighting. When Uche and Lydia are sitting there talking about the past, there's this one part where it's very vague, no one's pointing out, like she's telling him that he was lying and then he's telling her that she's lying and he's doing a lot of pauses because he's trying to think, like rack his brain, what lie to come up with. You remember the first argument we had where you weren't being exactly honest with me, right? And you weren't being honest with me either. Basically, she's accusing him of lying about something in the past, which we later found out what it is, that he was cheating on her. But he's turning it around and spinning it that the thing that she lied about is how she discovered his cheating. It is crazy how he's able to spin that reality. You lied to me. I didn't action. lie. If you were being honest with me, why was I upset then? Explain that. And then he says that he was honest about it, that he confessed basically. And Lydia points out that it took him a while to become honest. Let me explain to you. 
you were you were you asked me a question i was honest with you and i said what made after you a ask while, that question after a while and then lydia finally blurts it out and we know that it was cheating do you want like me to share what happened he slept with a girl when he was dating with me and then had the nerve to judge Aaliyah when she told her about her past. And it's really incredible because he's trying to reframe the problem as not him cheating on her, but the problem is how she found out, that it was dishonest the way she found out. <laughs> My God. And at the end of that fight, when she walks away, he's still spinning reality by focusing on Instagram. I'm not the one that was stalking people's Instagram. Yeah, the level of gaslighting in this guy, the gases this guy emits are stronger than the ones emitted by Shell. And a big example of the gaslighting is when he was recounting to Aaliyah why he stayed with Lydia. That, oh, she needed him. Oh, she was such a poor, helpless girl. I knew that this wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped talking to her. And after a while, I started to feel bad. She had just experienced a loss. Mm -hmm. And that is a real con act. <laughs> I cannot believe this. Oh, I'm so stupid. And the third sign is enjoying making other people feel small, like belittling people. And it shows up in so many instances with Uche, but really I noticed it when Milton came to interrupt that argument. And Milton's trying to come up with an excuse to take Lydia away, and he says, oh, we have plans in 10 minutes. And then after he leaves, Uche tells Lydia that he basically he's trying to belittle Milton and not believe him. He's like, you have to leave in 10 minutes or whatever the case may be. Me and Lydia, I actually have plans in 10 minutes. Let me finish this talk with him. Okay, I'll, I'll be, be outside. Uh, let, let's, let's skip forward, let's skip forward here a little bit because you have, you have plans in mm. 10 minutes or whatever the case may be. Whatever the case may be. Oh my God. Just the way he talks, it's... Whew. Yeah, he can't bear that Lydia has moved on and is actually happy with Milton. And speaking of Milton, how cute was it when he sat down and interrupted that fight and Lydia's like, where were you? I was looking for you. He's like, I was taking a piss in the urinal, like a child. Looking for you, where were you? I was taking a piss in the urinal. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. This other part when he was getting very nervous before meeting Lydia's family, of course, rightly so, like you would, you know, you're like wondering, what are they gonna think of me? How should I present myself? And he's like, should I present myself as more mature or more lovey? Do I want to seem like very mature? Or like, should I seem like super lovey? Super lovey? Milton, he's really so cute. <laughs> but anyway, back to what isn't cute, Uche. And that third sign about how he makes other people feel small, being hypercritical and making the other person feel like they're not good enough or guilt tripping them to get what he wants, which is something he does with Aaliyah a lot. When I found out that she had left, it's like I broke. Yeah, he really enjoys shaming her and putting her in her place. And the poor girl, she just nods along. Yeah, she's the perfect prey for a narcissist, Aaliyah. My God, this girl needs to do a lot of work to not take the bait. What's funny about this whole scene at the restaurant with Aaliyah is that Aaliyah is explaining why she left because Lydia got in her ear about the relationship she had with Uche and basically she started to have all those doubts about how deep their connection was. And it sounds pretty deep because even when Uche is recounting the whole history of how he left her and then felt bad and he came back and then left her and then when she got really strong and on her feet and went to therapy, he's like, oh, now she's strong enough to leave. But he very conveniently omitted the part that they had sex three months ago before the show started. What about that? Did you also feel that? <laughs> Is your heart, noble heart broken? Is that why you had sex with her? Girl. And he also tried to shift focus and manipulate the whole thing when Aaliyah points out that her doubts that... I don't know, maybe you guys came together to the show and you plan to come together to the show because apparently that's what Lydia said. And Uchi laughs it off in this very condescending way instead of saying, no, this is ridiculous. Like, what do you think we did? <laughs> we planned it, we came. <laughs> he makes her feel silly. Why the you hell know, would we do that? I don't that doesn't know, even though. make any sense. What would have been the plan? We would have came there I and don't... we would have pretended that we didn't know each other. And basically, Elia then is like, mm, well, I didn't mean it like that. And again, Uche, like this teacher tone. Yes, you did mean it. Once again, telling her how she feels. But I didn't mean it. Like, I didn't mean it. When but I you, said but it. you did mean it. 
I don't know if framing it as he loves making other people feel small, it's not that he loves it, but he just needs it. It's like his supply. It's how he can feel big by putting other people down and speaking in this <laughs> tone. Ooh. And the fourth sign is thriving on chaos and drama. And this is really evident when he takes Milton aside. He's like, let's get away from her. I have to tell you some stuff. Let's, let's walk away from her. I, I want to chat with you. There's a part of me that wants to burn it all down. And then they show us in the preview that basically he tells Milton that Lydia tried to come here because she's obsessed with me. Lydia planned to be here with me because she could have let me go. Once again, who is here following Lydia? You! And even Aliyah points out when they were at the restaurant earlier together that Uche is trying to infiltrate himself between Milton and Lydia. Again, trying to create chaos. Like, what is the point? To me, it was alarming because it's like, why are you so concerned about her and Milton's situation? Whether he was truly ready for marriage, you didn't want her to get hurt. Yeah, as Aliyah tells him that, you can see his brain trying to search of an answer of how he can make himself look like a good guy because he managed to explain away all those times that he went back to Lydia because she was so broken and struggling with her mental health that he needed to save her. But this one, he can't. He's suddenly very still and quiet. And I love how Aliyah managed to pick up on that he's still connected to Lydia. And she was also being slightly shady when she says, I know you're very concerned about her well-being, but you know, nice one, Aliyah. Maybe you just genuinely care about her well-being. I felt like there was still connectedness there. And the fifth sign is that it's never my fault. Never apologize, it's always someone else's mistake. Like how he blamed production for not confiding in Aliyah that he knew Lydia before. And how quick he is to find faults in someone else without acknowledging his own mistakes. Like all those times that he went back to Lydia is basically about her mental health. It's got nothing to do with him. So the question is, why do narcissists focus so much on other people? If narcissists indeed love themselves that much, if they are that self-serving, if they are that selfish, why do they focus on other people? So this begs the question, what is the self that they love? And Alan Watts has a couple of words about that. Ah, but I love myself. And what is me? How do, in what way do I know me? When it suddenly occurs to me, I can never get to look at me, real me. It's always hidden. And I really don't know it well enough to know whether I love it or not. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's an appalling mess. But certainly the things I do love and that I want from a selfish point of view, when I really think about them, they're all something else. That's in a way outside me. Why does all of that matter? You love yourself in terms of what is other. Because it's only in terms of what is other that you have a self at all. I don't want, I don't want to talk to her. And something very interesting in this Instagram Q&A that he did on Sunday, where he's blaming production, again, shifting focus onto production by saying that he gave them all these things about his childhood and his personal stuff, and they built a character of him as something different, which shows you that he's really here to build an image of himself. That talking about himself as a character and how his character development is on the show, like he's a fictional character almost. And also in those Instagram stories, someone basically asked him, is it true that Lydia planned to come on the show to stalk you? He's like, 100% confirmed. More to be found out later. Basically, he's teasing what's probably going to happen at the reunion, which is exactly what Zenab did in season three. And yet it was clear that Cole was in the right. And I'm sure he's not going to have receipts. Mm -mm. So basically, when you're dealing with an antagonistic narcissist, or any narcissist really, like the situation Aliyah finds herself in, what do you do? There are four things to do. First, don't take the bait. Resist. Just almost like step out of yourself, maybe breathe a little bit and watch and observe what the other person is doing. Just don't take the bait. Even if you're angry, sit with your anger. Just don't take the bait because they're constantly trying to bait you in. Number two, set boundaries. Say, it's not okay for you to speak to me in this way. And in the beginning, it's gonna feel very fake and forced because you're gonna be truly triggered. But the more you practice that, the easier it's gonna get. By saying, no, you cannot talk to me in this way. I'm not gonna become part of this argument. I'm not gonna be roped in to your little game. Constantly set boundaries. And number three, lean on a support network of friends. Have people who have your back, basically, that you can always go to. And the fourth one is seek therapy, girl, because we all need to. Now, I would like to zoom out from the antagonistic narcissist, talk about narcissists in general. 
Because what all narcissists seek is endless validation, praise, and attention. You know, you often hear the word narcissistic supply. That is what attention and validation is for the narcissist. It's the supply. It's the oxygen. And this is a nice transition to Izzy. And once again, we're not diagnosing people with a personality disorder. We're just pointing out narcissistic traits. And Izzy really embodies them, especially this obsession with external validation from others when he seeks out Lydia. Lydia is a very attractive girl, very pretty girl trying to prove that his exes are still into him, which seems very desperate because they never asked for this. Those conversations were really not necessary. I don't want there to be any bad blood. You know what I mean? I don't. You know, but like I at the same time, like having closure sucks. It's like he's dying to keep the door open where he's indirectly flirting with Lydia, talking about the connection and dropping the word that she's hot. Honestly, at the same time, I would have not let it go so far if there was not a connection. There was a connection. They're like, I would have never dragged you on and like just been like, oh, she sounds fun or she sounds hot. Also, what really struck me as narcissistic about that is that he would never let her speak. See, that's what, I, so this is what I did. This is my mindset when I went in. It's like he loves the sound of his own voice. He keeps interrupting her. But I love how she shut him down. It really reminded me of how Raven shut down Bartiz in season three when they met in the pool. It's like, nope, not interested. Mm -mm. And I believe you, I do, but I can't assure you. I'm in love with Milsan. By the way, a big sign of how insecure and how desperate someone is, desperate to still be in the mix, to still try to hold on, is when someone is over-talking. Because the person who is not concerned, like Lydia in the scene, is just sitting there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and he's doing the talking. Because over-talking is a sign of nervousness. And Izzy really displays that. Like, he's just saying things like, why are you saying all this stuff? It doesn't matter. And interestingly enough, his fiance Stacy, deep down inside, she knows that Izzy's a player. My only concern with him was like, everyone's like, he's a player. Uh -huh. He's gonna fucking play, he's gonna break your heart. And a big sign of him being a player, did you notice that part where they were in bed together, Izzy and Stacy, and talking about meeting each other's families? And Stacy was like, my family's completely on board. And it's kind of obvious that his mother is a little bit hesitant or apprehensive. And then it comes up, why? Why is she? I would always just not be fully confident in somebody. Um, or find something about them that just kind of like, I guess, like turn me off about them or I something. I know, that's like my fear. And another very sketchy moment or conversation that Izzy has with, with Johnny, when Johnny shows up at the barbecue. Yeah, he was clearly worked up as he confronted Johnny and he's trying to make it look like he's concerned for his friend Chris, just dragging Chris into the situation for no reason. Like that's what you care about that Johnny was basically like manipulating Chris. Really girl. And again, that interrupting, he won't let her speak. Izzy, at what point can I talk? Because you've been talking for like 10 Fair minutes. Yeah, can yeah. I please talk now? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You were my number one. So to me, I was like fucking heart. But then again, I wasn't your only number one. Hey, can you just you. listen to me real quick? The whole time we were in the pods, I had one number one. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm now trying to make shit up to Chris. And not only that, he just like launches into an attack by calling her sketchy as fuck and that everyone here thinks you're sketchy as fuck and also there was a moment where he looks at the camera just making sure that the camera is catching him it happens so quick it's almost like unconscious if i can give you advice no i don't scenario, need your advice i feel like you do need it because honestly it's not just me everyone thinks you're sketchy as fuck and by the way he's also overcompensating because then after this conversation when he goes to stacy he's like oh my god i love you i love you and he's clearly like worked up and charged and even Stacy's like, my God, you're shook up. You look like shaken up. Are no, you? I'm not shaken up. I'm just like annoyed. And he completely spins reality here, just like Uche, by telling Stacy that it was Johnny who called him and Stacy also sketchy as fuck. And she's like, why would she do that? She's like, I don't know. It doesn't even make sense. It's like, really? You're the one who attacked her. What did she say? She's like, all of y'all are fucking sketchy. How is everyone sketching you? That's what I was trying to say. I was like, you make no fucking sense. And because he's so worked up, he's overcompensating by kissing Stacy and telling her, oh, I'm so grateful for you. And Stacey's like, mm -mm, don't do that. Don't be grateful for me because you just dealt with someone crazy or a crazy situation. Like she's onto him. I don't even care about her. I'm just so good. I guess after being here and like seeing... Don't be like, I'm grateful for you because this is fucking crazy. No, but I think the real reason Izzy's worked up about Johnny it's not about Chris or that he's, you know, worried for his friend Chris or that she's manipulating Chris. It's because Johnny said that he has low credit score. And this is a big trigger point for him because she shattered his image, the image he's trying to keep. Because I think he's very insecure about having had no money. And it's very obvious when Stacy visits his house and she notices the plastic 
uh, plates and cups and she's laughing at them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I know we come from different backgrounds. I didn't have, you know, like fancy dinners and restaurants and, you know, things like that. Also a little random note, like how when Stacy looks at those plates, she does this weird fake Sharon Stone from the 90s voice. It's astonishing. This is astonishing. But anyway, his insecurity about money really kicks into high gear when they visit Stacy's house and he sees the house that she bought with all the fancy stuff. And this is when Stacy brings up the finances. Money is a fun conversation. It is something that I do want to talk to you about though. Um, like as far as savings, 401k, retirement, like you set a certain amount of money aside. And he's biting his lip. He's biting his lip so hard it's almost about to bleed. We need to go ev over everything, all the uncomfortable stuff the savings, the checking. And that's how she manages to make it even worse and make him more nervous by pointing out that she's from a rich family and that her dad will take care of it. And I've seen so many people take advantage of me or my dad because they know that, that there is money. Because I don't like the feeling of, oh, well, I can sit back and lax and enjoy the ride because I know that her dad's going to pay for everything because he probably will. Further emasculating him, not on purpose, of course, but if you have such a trigger about having grown up with nothing, something like that will really like put you down. And I think because he can't take it out on Stacy or her family, that's why he managed to project it all on Johnny and be upset with her. And it's so interesting when Stacy takes him to visit her family and Izzy's trying to make conversation with her father by saying, oh, how was it raising three girls? And then Stacy's father points out that one time when they went to Nice, they had this bag full of shoes. And the awkward thing about that scene is that I don't think Izzy knows what Nice is, that Nice is part of France. And then Stacy he says, oh, we went on holiday to France, the family, and he takes a drink. We get to Nice and the driver picks it. He's like, what is this? I'm like, that's shoes. It's just shoes. <laughs> Here? Nah. We went to France. Also, at this scene with the uh, Stacy's family, Stacy really, mm, I think she crosses a line where she's telling her family that oh, Izzy doesn't have a passport, you guys. <laughs> oh my God. And he has plastic cups. <laughs> Mm -mm. Little side note, by the way, when Stacy's father took Izzy aside to sit outside in the terrace to talk about the money and all the stuff, did you notice how Izzy's legs were not reaching the ground? He was like a kid. And it was such a visual symbol of how overwhelmed by the riches and the house and everything. It was so funny. Yeah, I don't think Izzy's made peace with his background being poor or having had no stuff. He talks about it like he's proud of himself, but mm, I don't think so. There seems to be something lingering there. And again, that's why he was angry with Johnny. And speaking of Johnny, by the way, when she showed up to that barbecue, she was actually projecting all her own feelings about Chris and how doubtful she still is about him by making it about Izzy. Because Izzy accuses her that you know, she's not into Chris, which she isn't. But basically she goes to Chris and she says things that Izzy never says, like, oh, I'm a piece of shit and that I don't deserve you. It's like, wow. Uh, he thinks I don't deserve you. Like, forever, That's like, what he was telling you. Like, you know how great that guy is. But, like, you're a piece of shit. Pleasant, but, that doesn't... but I think it's what her mother thinks of it because from the second she enters this barbecue scene, she's crying already about what a great human uh, Chris is and that her mom finally approves, which makes you think that she's actually crying because she finally got her mom's approval and that her mom thinks Chris is amazing, which indirectly implies that her mom thinks that she's not worthy of Chris. He's just, he's such a good person. He is. Uh, my mom has met him <laughs> and she said he's the best person you've ever dated. Yeah, the trouble with Johnny and Izzy and also Uche that we're talking about in this video is that neither of these people has made peace with the dark side of themselves. They're not able to look at themselves, the shadow self, you know, because when you bring that shadow into the light and look at it and really openly talk about it, it no longer has power over you. Because we all have that side of us, that shadow, the thing that we're ashamed of, the thing we're ashamed to show other people and bring into the light. For me, before starting my journey with drag, by the way, the thing that I was ashamed of and I wasn't ready to acknowledge is that I love to be in the center of attention, that I love to take center stage and perform and be this person that you're seeing before you here or on the stage. And I call it like the fame monster. And ever since I made friends with it, I let that fame monster out to take center stage on, on a literal stage or here. Finally, when I did that in my normal everyday life, I don't need to take center stage. I don't interrupt people because that's part of me is satiated. So I don't need to let it spill into other areas of my life. Yeah, that part of you will continue to torture you until you face it and bring it out into the open. 
to, as it were, put the devil in us in its proper function. Because, you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. Uh, what? So guys, this brings us to the end of the video. Oh, by the way, I didn't comment about JP and Taylor and that whole makeup mess because I'm pretty sure there's going to be a follow-up at the reunion, so I'm going to include it in that. And also, it doesn't fit the theme of this video. And you know, she brings you themes. Anyway, guys, love you. Please comment, like, and subscribe. You are totally selfish.